I'm very happy to introduce Ray Armentrout for our concluding summer enclave reading. I am delighted to have gotten to know Ray in her everyday life since she moved to the Seattle area a few years ago. Ray in person and on the page likes excitement is an excitement sister. There are many reasons to admire Ray's poetry. Most mentioned is its incisive surprising and sometimes surreptitious thought. It also needs to be admired for its inclusions. Just about anything under the sun can end up there. Financial crashes, begonias, mackerel, barnacles, ether. Lydia Davis writes of Ray as a magnetic poet who embraces the strangeness of our familiar world. I like the notion of magnet, Ray's poetry is a magnet pulling in the whatever of our existence. Ray has been compared aptly to William Carlos Williams and Emily Dickinson, and I would also suggest Lorene Niedeker. She is an amalgam or crossroads of all three, yet she is very much herself. Lorene Niedeker, in a much cited poem, describes her own, Lorene's, poetic practice and precisely the way I've come to understand Ray's poetic, poetic practice. I learned to sit at desk and condense, no layoffs from this condensory. Ray Armentrout is the author of 14 books of poems. Her most recent book, Wobble, was a finalist for the National Book Award and versed, won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Critics Award in 2010. A new book, Conjure, will be published by Wesleyan in September, from which she will be reading today, as well as other new poems. She is Professor Emerita from UC San Diego. Here's Ray. Thank you, Jean. Uh, I heard some of it and it was great. I'm gonna start by reading from my uh, new book, Conjure with this uh, amazing rabbit on it. It's dedicated to my granddaughters, three and a half year old twins, Renee and Sasha. And it's gonna be out uh, officially out September 8th, I think. Okay. Conjure. How did the synthesis cross the abyss? In a sentimental story, there is only one of something, one newborn, one moment, one once embalmed in myrrh. All I want is not to be first on one side, then the other, but to conjure a stream of sounds and images for which I am not responsible and maneuver within it. Mouth and tail, one thought. The sea now full of cannibal jellies, blue, if the sky says so. Pinocchio, strand, string, in this dream, the paths cross and cross again. They are spelling a real boy out of repetition. Each one is the one real boy. Each knows he must be wrong about this, but he can't feel how. The fish and the fisherman, the pilot, the princess, the fireman, and the ones on fire. Speculative fiction. The idea that producing a string of nonsense syllables while pointing toward an object may cause that object to change is common in children on the verge of language. The idea that force exists only as an interaction between objects, while an object is a kind of kink in a force field. The idea that if one survives X number of years, one will live to see how things turn out, or even that things end well. In the future, we will face new problems. 
how will we represent the variety of human types once all the large animals are gone? As sly as a mother? As hungry as an orphan? Notice, the way a gesture used to ward off trouble became cheerful waving. There was so much looming and vanishing to take note of always. We felt like play actors before we knew what we were about and after. Turns out the mummy's curse is real. You pump thick death out of the ground and burn it, it kills you. But in all the movies, curses are a cheap plot trick. The doofus who can't read the hieroglyph dies first and no one misses him, them. We were born yesterday. We're sorry. Care. Dress like you care. Eat like you care. Care like you care. You don't think apples just grow on trees, do you? A fish taps a clam against a bony knob of coral to crack its shell, which demonstrates intelligence, yes, but is the fish pleased with itself? Alone in your crib, you form syllables. Are you happy when one is like another? Add yourself to yourself. Now you have someone. Project. Your clock's been turned to zero, though there is no zero on a clock. Your skin is petal soft no matter how old the starter kit was, but you will get tired or bored. That's when the clock starts up. Your parents want you happy, but we also want to set you down to get back to our old lives. How will you turn against us once you figure this out? You're about to discover intention. There are four stuffed animals in front of you on strings they are targets. You won't understand this for a while. You flail your arms. Sometimes you make one bounce. Are humans the only creatures who must learn to move with purpose? Is that why we harp on motive? Why we think of earth as some God's handiwork? Pretty little. I'm not lonely because I have secrets. I'm lonely because words can't bring the past into the present, which amounts to the same thing. Jackrabbit and the Lonely Present is the title of a book I almost wrote. I'm lonely because you're sure you've heard something like this everywhere before. Polly Peapod and the Deep Hole. You think you can make something out of it, the way you made much of the slanted light and deep shadows of autumn. None such. This eucalyptus with its elliptical leaves dangling light and dry as an abandoned chrysalis, with its modest bunches of pale pink flowers and languid pose is my unattainable ideal of a piece in pieces, past it all and in plain view, nowhere in the blasted web of stars is there any such beauty. I think I've just, I skipped a couple because we kind of got had some technical problems. Now see, don't worry. We have armies of showrunners writing our dreams, ones where we're featured as skilled apparatchiks facing credible threats 
that appear and disappear like clockwork, leaving no apparent damage. It was all one to me, all pain pleasure, all squirmy life death, until your head broke the surface and looked backward and forward. Now see what you've done. Okay, so that was from Conjure. And then I have a new book that's going to come out in, I don't know when, but it's called um, Threat Landscape. So I'm going to read some from it now. Hang on. Domestic as an empty shopping cart parked on a ledge above a freeway. Artifactual as an acorn barnacle. What is the purpose of barnacles? People ask the internet. Barnacles are filter feeders. They're fish tank decor. A plaque of barnacles on top of a toilet. This cluster of brittle puckers <coughs> clinging to its old idea. These craters striped pale lavender for some unlikely eye. I think I'll skip that too. The sleep problem. If there's anything I can do to help me, I said, that's not what I meant. I must hold my intention in my mind's eye or it will go astray. I must remember to intend to hold it tenderly. Kickity doodah, I say when you flop over in bed thrashing, meaning zippity brouhaha in a language I keep forgetting you don't speak. A sentence begins and ends in the present, but on the way, we need to hurry. Zippity doodah is a slave song commissioned by Walt Disney. Elmer Fudd aims his blunderbuss, his boundless abstract rage. On growth, dressed all in plastic, which means oil, we're bright eyed, scrambling for the colored cubes spilled on the rug's polymer. Inside each is a tiny car. When we can't unscrew the tops, we cry for help. We're optimists. To sleep is to fall into belief. Airing even our worst suspicions may be pleasurable. We are carried, void. In sleep, the body can heal itself, grow larger. Creatures that never wake can sprout a whole new limb, a tail. This may be wrong. And then this was kind of an experiment because it's a prose poem uh, in three titled parts. These days, taste. We've developed a fondness for mid-century murk, meaning the last mid-century, not the one soon to come with its increasingly toxic air. We've developed a taste for the coldest of cold cases being worked by impossibly earnest child sleuths or laconic county sheriffs in tiny desert towns. What is making the phone lines crackle? Does this noise sound menacing to you? We've developed a necrophiliac's taste for remoteness. Those just beyond living memory are the most distant, the strangest of strangers. Tasks. Each day I stare at the gap between and and then with the sense that if I am very quiet, something important will come out of it. Am I languid, pensive, or anxious? Any one of these words is a Polaroid I am reluctant to inhabit. Yet, taken together, they make a pyramid, that most stable of forms. Signals. Everything the children do is a reenactment of something half grasped or glimpsed. We call such portrayals play but they are similar to the way aliens might attempt to communicate by reproducing signals from old TV broadcasts, including the static between stations. This one uses a falsetto 
to indicate that there are two of her, the one speaking now and the one we will never hear. How to disappear. You had been swinging restlessly between the, starting again. You had been swinging restlessly between the appearance of spontaneity and the appearance of serious thought. You had been changing lanes after a glance in a mirror honest about its tendency to distort. What choice did you have? It was soothing to watch wisps of smoke from a nearby chimney disappearing one by one. Do you like pulses, ridges, ripples, stretching into obscurity? Would you prefer a flicker to a steady light source? This one stutters slightly, hesitant, as if it could hold something in reserve. Riddance. Okay, we've rendered the rendition how often? What were we try what were we trying to get rid of? We exposed the homeless character of desire to the weather. Shall we talk about the weather? Worsening four times faster than expected, eight times until the joy of pattern recognition kicks in, until the crest of the next ridge is what remains of division. Okay, so I'm going to read for, I don't know, another seven minutes or something from new work written during the pandemic period. I don't know how far I'll get. Buy-in. Yes, we did ask to be born. Not all of us, of course. Only the first few. They must have bought in to this round robin duress, the gasp, the gnawing hunger, then the actual gnawing. Maybe they did it the way we'd put on a corset or toe shoes one night and feel fabulous. To be able to repeat themselves must have seemed like such a thrill at first. But who were they if not that trick? that breathless pirouette. Plague year. What we share is the Chicano detective in 1930s Los Angeles, torn between his loyalty to his community and his loyalty to his partner. What we have in common is the orphan girl, trained as an assassin, secretly working against the cabal of rogue agents who plan to make use of her skills. What we share is distance, telephone poles leaning this way and that, a wayward crowd that staggers drunkenly toward an empty mauve horizon. We can't wait to see who dies next. And this one is called a panicle. A panicle is a kind of flower blossom. Panicle. The hope is that the fungus, mycelium, exchanges messages through a vast underground network. The hope is that we're not alone. A small black spider cautiously explores the wet plastic trash bag. A woman somewhere across the street says, I don't know, and laughs. The hope is in the facts. Buzzing, a bee slams time and again against a blue-black wall. The hope is that the universe is formed of an infinite number of Y-shaped prongs, rocking stiffly in the wind, spitting out lilac panicles. Startle reflex. This one is, like, brand new. Ford's robo-dogs roam the factory floor and enjoy a good belly rub. People are startled to discover that their inner monologues are ghost-written. A sentence that once made sense and now does not appears haunted. Experts are surprised to learn 
sparrows across North America have changed their tune. Let's just make it to the end. Everyone's riveted by the shock of the disaster victims, the way they search for words. Uh, let's see, I guess, all right, I'm gonna read two more and then, then we'll be done. Lonely girl. It wasn't her fault. She couldn't have loved any of them because they never came out of themselves, emerged. As what? Disembodied? Transparent? She couldn't explain herself either. Self is an area where will intersects with drift. It has ruffled, frothy edges, like a square dance dress. Look. Lying in the dark, nose buried in her arms, crook, she felt like a girl, or pictured herself as one, or loved herself as much as she had when she was a girl and first coiled up. That was her secret. Okay, and this will be the last one. Password. As if the problem were that I couldn't stuff the bulky text into the child's backpack and was late for a class I never registered for so long ago. Business tiptoes in a world of masks. People relate to a transparent sham, as if genre weren't camo. Strange to wake rested after these dreams of disaster and scandal not registered as such. When I stared long enough at the rough-skinned, snub-nosed, or tough-nippled lemons, I will give attention to World Password Day. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Thanks uh, very much, Ray. That was terrific. Great to hear and to hear the new poems as well. And uh, we will bid adieu from Enclave till the end of September. And uh, we do have our lineup beginning September 27th. Uh, it's Joelle McSweeney, uh, followed by, I'm not going to give dates, but Herman, Erica Hunt, Rodrigo Toscano, Susan Gewurz, Monica Yoon, Charles Alexander, and Liz Willis. So we hope you'll join us in September. Uh, for many of you who've been to many enclaves, it's been great to see your faces, uh, if not your voices, which we would really love to hear. And uh, so thank you. Thank you for being here. And thank you, Ray, for hosting this and for a fabulous reading. Oh, thank you, Jean. You too. <laughs>